All right. Um, yeah, so uh, I was just asking uh, my brother, Derek, thank you so much for leading us in prayer. And I was asking him how much time I have, and he mentioned he wasn't sure. So I've set my clock to about three hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so if, if, if it's okay with you, would you like to stand? Uh, I'd like us to pray together. And uh, I, don't know, I don't know what, what attitude you come with in terms of where you are and what you're looking towards to God. But I just thought we would use a psalm that I could encourage us to just continue to looking to God even as we go through this time. So Psalm 44, I just want us to pray through this psalm, about two or three verses um, that begin with. And as we pray, again, just consider where you are and uh, what's going on. I know there could be needs, maybe there are things that are pressing you and you're really, really pressed. Uh, but I think the prayer really is that God would uh, revive that faith and trust and relationship with him. Okay, so as we share and read and, and pray, I would like you to make it personal as you pray. And as we pray for the ministry and as we pray for um, this church, as we pray for the church generally in Uganda, uh, why don't we pray? Lord, we are grateful for this time and encouragement that we receive, an opportunity uh, to be encouraged by you. And Lord, we speak, oh God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. You with your own hand drove out the nations, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples, but them you set free. For not by their own sword did they win the land, nor did their own arms save them, but your right hand and your arm. And the light of your face, for you delighted in them. You are my king, O God, Ordain salvation for Jacob. Lord, we look to you and we trust you. And maybe we have heard of so many things and we have heard wonders. And so, Lord, we want to commit our lives to you. And we pray, Lord. But indeed, you revive. You revive our hearts to hunger indeed and thirst for you. Be devoted truly to you and your word. To let go of the sin that so easily hinders. And to run the race, fixing our eyes on you, dear author, king. That this world will not consume us and all that is in this world, but we will truly, truly be devoted. At this moment in time, those things that we have chosen to put aside will not pick them up after these days. That we will truly, truly be devoted to you all the days of our lives. That the things that we think about and see and hear from your word truly will be applicable to our lives. But yes, there could be needs, there could be places of request, but our heart's desires will be truly, truly after you as that deer pants for the water that will pant after you. That will go beyond Uh, that which has been set for us, but personally will seek you and seek after you. Open our hearts, Lord, to truly know you, truly desire your word, truly, 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 
and one of the most difficult ones, be open to be transformed by you. Not just hearers of your word, but that will be doers. We'll walk in the fruit, in the faith, that our faith will be a light and salt that will truly bring transformation for the glory of your name, that men will be drawn to you to become more like you. Give us grace. Give us strength to be devoted like Paul as young men to walk and be sensitive about our conduct, purity, love, faith, that people will not look down on us, but we will set an example. Yes, may this be our time, not to take over, but our time to shine the light, truly walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Here we are, Lord. We have heard. Will you do it in our time? Revive it, O Lord. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have your seats. Joy and privilege uh, to be here. Uh, Isaac David Kisembo is my name. Yes, but you can call me Zach. I'm happy to see all of you and glad to see all of you here. Um, yeah, if you haven't greeted your neighbor, maybe you can greet them and say hello. Um, and you can tell them before we tear our clothes in dust and ashes, you can smile. Uh, oh, okay. All right. Okay. So, in our time, Revive it, Habakkuk 3, 2. And under that we have the theme, my house will be called a house of prayer. Matthew 21, 12 to 14. Also found in John 2, 13 to 23. Also found in Luke 19, 28 to 48. Also found in Mark 11, 1 to 19. Okay. So, um, Habakkuk, of course, if you have read the book, the prophet speaking, and he speaks, uh, he's bringing complaints to the Lord about what has been going on, and the Lord responds. He tells them, he speaks to the Lord, and he says, why is all this happening to Israel? A foreign nations, Babylon, coming here, taking, destroying everything, and so forth and so on. And so he's saddened by the so many things that are going on. But the Lord brings response uh, about all those things. And so in, in, in Habakkuk 3, uh, the Lord speaks again. And he says, O oh Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of deeds, O oh Lord. Repeat them. Habakkuk, sorry, is speaking and speaks and makes a prayer in a sense. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. Okay? And it says, in mercy or in wrath, remember mercy. All right? Picked up again from Psalm 44, 1 to 3, where we just read. Scary kind of prayer that I just thought about. Um, should he really revive? Should he revive? Should, he, should his works or deeds be seen. When we think about Moses, we realize that when the Lord came, when the Lord descended, it was not a very good time. All right? Uh, people usually ran away. People fled. Okay? Uh, his presence was not something that uh, not many enjoyed. And they always said, Moses, this is where you come in. And so do your work. Uh, do, this, this, is, this is your territory. Okay? And so as we consider, revive it in our time, get ready. Because if he truly, 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 truly does come, his deeds, his wonders, his works, his word, then some things need to change. So as we pray about it, maybe 
it's a moment for you to consider your life and where you are and whether the presence of God finds comfort where you are in terms of your lifestyle and so forth and so on. Okay, so my house will be called a house of prayer. Jesus speaking these words uh, to so many that were gathered. All right, and I've given you the references. Uh, so we are going to be flowing in between those references. I'll pick up a few different things from the different places. So the context, of course, Jesus entering Jerusalem. This is probably a week or so before his arrest or crucifixion. Jesus is coming, all right? That's where we see him, the temple. But just, be, but just before that, that's a triumphant entry, all right? So, this, so I, I just want us to backtrack just a little bit, all right? So if you have your Bible, you can turn to Matthew 21 or Luke 19. I'll be, I'll be using those, or Mark 11, all right? So we backtrack, of course, the story is Jesus sends out disciples and says, hey, go and find a colt uh, or a donkey, and if they ask you, just say, the Lord needs it. Oh, it's, it's quite amazing. Uh, and, and, and when we read the story, immediately these guys release the colt. Very interesting, all right? Uh, let me just let you know that those days they didn't have WhatsApp or WhatsApp voice. There was no telegram, all right? But Jesus says, hey, just tell them the Lord needs it, okay? And from what we see, we don't see, any, we don't see anyone saying, who is the Lord? <laughs> Which Lord are you meaning? There are so many lords, okay? But the time had come, okay, for the work that needed to be done. So, we read uh, Mark 11, many people spread their cloaks on the ground while others spread branches, okay? Uh, Matthew says, 21.8, most of them spread their cloaks on the road, others cut branches and spread them. Of course, as we read, we recognize it was walking through the Mount of Olives, there were probably so many. But think about this. Jesus is walking through and getting to his place. These guys were really quick. Cut these things down, just threw them down there. All right? And, and as you can see, many people, most of them, I think Luke says the whole multitude. Okay? So this is everyone. Jesus is coming in. Everyone is excited. Yay! Our Messiah. You know, and so forth. And so they are spreading their cloaks. Okay? And they are spreading the branches. And so verse 9, they begin to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes. And so Hosanna, of course, to mean save us. Save us. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. So I can imagine the entry into Jerusalem and according to this, by the way, we probably all could have been in here. The whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice. They began to praise with a loud voice with, for the mighty works that they had seen, that the Lord has done. And so they rejoice at his coming. Jesus is here. Jesus is among us. And they are praying and saying, save us, save us. Hallelujah, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. They speak of his, of his praise. And so, perhaps, I just thought about it, that maybe, could be that your voice no longer believes in calling on his name. You no longer believe that he can save and deliver. But it's encouragement here to sing, to speak, to call on his name, to not give up to call on the name of the Lord, to call on him to save, save, deliver. Now, whether they truly understood what that means, I'm not so sure. The psalmist says in 118, 25, save us, we pray, O Lord, deliver us, deliver deliver and save us. And that's probably one of the places we need to 
pray and ask the Lord to save, save us, save us, deliver us. And so they speak of that. But it reminds me of something. Reminds me of Maranatha. Maranatha speaks of the return of Jesus. O oh Lord, come. O oh Lord, come. O oh Lord, come. And perhaps you could look at the world and what's going on around and you're thinking, O oh Lord, come. It could even be what's going on in your life and you feel hard-pressed, you feel shaken, and you're tired, and you're weary. He invites us, he invites you to call on his name. Very interesting parting shots by Paul in 1 Corinthians 16. He ends with this, verse 19, the churches of Asia send your greetings Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, send your hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And then 21, I, Paul, write these greetings with my own hand. In verse 22, if anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Oh, Lord, come. What a greeting, eh? <laughs> Ah, if anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Oh, Lord, come. Paul doesn't squeeze in there, repent. He says, ah, oh, Lord, come. And as we consider Hosanna, oh, Lord, save us. Friends, I need to remind you that his second coming is with judgment. And as we consider if anyone has no love for the Lord. A time is coming when the Lord is coming. The King of Kings is coming. His return is imminent. This must help us question where our lives are, our lifestyle, our living, our purity, our walk, our generosity. Do you consider that the Lord is coming? He's coming back and he's coming soon. The disciples thought about this and they thought he was coming. How much more can we think about the Lord's coming? He's coming. And this time when he comes, he's not coming to save. He's coming to bring judgment. And so this can be both an encouragement of comfort or it can be a time of trouble for you, especially if you're not living a life that pleases the Lord. So the question is, where do you fall? If you feel afflicted and going through a difficulty, be encouraged because the Lord is coming. Maranatha, the Lord is coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. I we'll take time to read some of the things in the news and some of them are heartbreaking. And you wonder, oh Lord, when, when, when do you come? When do you come, oh Lord? And maybe our prayer requests, the way we pray needs to change. Maybe we need to pray, oh Lord, come, come, come. I was reading a story yesterday, very heartbreaking, as I thought about my daughter. Uh, about a body of a baby, one year old, that was found, a girl, in the, in the gardens. Uh, but the story was that the baby was raped, defiled, I think. And my heart, as I looked at my daughter, I, I, my heart just broke, you know. And as I think about all the sin, think about what happened even in Kasese, I just think, Lord, these evil men, this evil, this wickedness that is in the world, oh Lord, come, come, come. But it could even be injustice in your home. It could be injustice even in this church. Maybe we need to pray, oh Lord, come, oh Lord, come, oh Lord, come. 
So we should consider then Hosanna, and we should consider Maranatha. And so as Jesus goes on, when you turn to Luke 19, particularly then, there's so much that is going on. Let's pick it up from verse 37. As he's drawing near already on the way down the mountain of olives, a whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and sing praise God with a loud voice of all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. They speak about a peace. Peace in heaven. Okay? And glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees and the crowd say to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if they were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now we see something interesting in verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. Jesus, hearing all this that is going on, he prays, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Jesus approaches Jerusalem. And the Bible says he wept. I mean, I'm probably thinking, what, what's, what's going on? I mean, you've been in a meeting, or you've been in a party, or you've been in something. And, you know, everyone is happy and excited. And, you know, maybe you made it. Maybe you, I don't know, got something. And, you know, it's time for you. To, you're given the mic. And Jesus weeps. Huh? What's, what, what's going on? Why? Why? What's with the weeping? I mean, Hosanna. We are, we are, we are singing Hosanna. We are praising you. We are, okay, we, 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 see, we see the light that you're coming in, hopefully. Hosanna. And Jesus weeps. And 42, he says, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. That's something. What's going on? What? Huh? What? What are you saying? <laughs> Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed is the king. As you come into the church, as you come, maybe you've been coming to this church for a while. You sing, you praise. And I think I was just thinking, Jesus steps in as we sing, as we praise him, what would be his reaction? But let's consider what is he saying? This is what he's saying. Jesus is saying, Jerusalem, one has rejected him and missed the opportunity for peace. He's crying and sobbing. He's thinking and looking at Jerusalem. He's thinking about the people and saying, you guys, I'm missing the true peace. You're missing it. You're singing a Hosanna. But that Hosanna is misconceived. It's a wrong concept of what you're thinking about. The things that make for peace. This is hidden. The true peace of God that surpasses human understanding. The Prince of Peace weeps about the fact that people do not understand the kind of peace that he gives. He was weeping about their ignorance. That seemed to know, that looked like it knows, but he was weeping. His heart was heavy about what was going on. Do you know the true peace of God? When circumstances overwhelm you, which Jesus do you call on to? Which one do you know? His disciples reminder when they're in the boat and they look to him and they say, don't you care that we die? He's trying to say, hey, 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 hey boss, savior, 
if you're still, anyway. Hello, can't you see what's going on? How many times? How many times do you come to God and say, uh, 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 boss, the fees, can't you, can't you see I'm going to be chased from school? Can, can, can't you see this is going, can't you see what's happening? Where are you? Jesus, Jesus whips. Jesus whips. Then he goes on to say in 43, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in every side and tear down to the ground you and your children within you. Judgment and punishment. Time of the Romans, that will come. Jesus is weeping in his omniscience, in his ability to know what's going on, saying, because you do not understand true peace. They rejected the true prince of peace as they looked to a certain soldier. So, of course, you know that in the year AD 70, you know, Israel was absolutely taken down. Temple was destroyed, and just that glorious wall that is known as the Wailing Wall today. And the Jews to this day cry over the city, over the destruction of the city. They cry and say, Lord, you have taken this away. Revive it. And some still believe for its revival. And to this day, close to him, yet do not truly understand that the Prince of Peace came to give in inner peace, inward, eternal peace. And he speaks and he says, in this world, though you may have trouble, though you hear warnings of so many things, take heart because I have overcome the world. He speaks to you and says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And perhaps this day, you wail over that which you have lost. Perhaps you wail. Perhaps you say, that was, that's what I was supposed to be. Jesus like to offer true peace. It's time to let go. Let go of what you think you are supposed to have and receive the true peace. Receive the true peace. Perhaps, just maybe perhaps, you struggle because you're still holding on and are not receiving his peace. Of course, in Matthew 21, we recognize that Jesus curses the fig tree, a sign of Israel's disobedience and lack of fruit. Jesus looks at Jerusalem and weeps. And weeps because of their ignorance, misconception, refusal to receive him as the life giver, the true peace. But he weeps because of the punishment that is coming. And so he ends it, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation because you did not know the time. So has he visited you? Has Christ come to you? Has Christ come to your heart? Have you received Christ? Have you received the true Christ? That's a question to consider. And maybe you can think, but it, it looks like they, they had received him because they welcomed him. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But they received the wrong concept of Christ. They received the wrong concept of Christ. And so many, many struggle today because they think about Christ should do a certain thing like this and like this and like this. 
Perhaps in your life, maybe you're struggling. Do you have the true concept of the one who saves from sin and brings restoration? And so Jesus then comes, here we come, finally, to our passage. And he enters the temple. Jesus enters the temple. And begins to drive out all those who are selling. And he says, it is written, my house, my house shall be a house of prayer. A house of worship. A house of communion. And Isaiah 56, 7 confirms that. But Jesus is trying to say that my house has a purpose. My house has a purpose. And this is not the purpose. What's going on now is not the purpose. Guys, look around. Is his house serving the purpose? Physically, let's be literal. Is this house serving the purpose? Is it serving the purpose? Is it a house of prayer? Let's gain a burden of the house of the Lord. Let's think about this church, but also think about the church that you're going to. Is worship and prayer happening? Is devotion happening? Let's think about the teen service. Let's think about the 3 p.m. Is worship happening? Is it truly, truly happening? If Jesus, like I said, walked in here, what would he do first? What do you think? You tell your neighbor, what do you think? What would Jesus do first if he walked in here? Think about your places of communion or fellowship. What would Jesus do if he walked in here? Having whipped, having shared his heart about what's going on, he enters the temple. Now let's think about this a little deeper, and this is the gist of the matter. Acts 17, 24. I hope there's a difference then in how you begin to consider these things. Acts 17, 24. Paul speaking in Athens. And he says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that God's spirit dwells in you? Hebrews 3, 6, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son and we are his house and we are his house and we are his house if, we, if indeed we hold our confidence and our boasting in our hope. And lastly, 1 Peter 2.5. You yourselves, like living stones, are built up as a spiritual house. Let me just repeat those. Acts 17.24, 1 Corinthians 3.9, and, and verses 16 and 17. Hebrews 3.6, and 1 Peter 2.5. You yourselves are like living stones built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so it's not new then that Christ speaks of you as the house of God. He speaks of your body. He speaks of you, of your mind, your intellect, 
Whatever it is that, that, that encompasses who you are, deeper and on the level now, it's not news to you that Christ speaks of you, that you are the house of God. You are the temple of the Spirit of God, that God dwells in you, that the Spirit of God is in you. And so as I just begin to think about this, I begin to think about what Christ sees when he looks at me. What Christ sees when he looks at what you do. What Christ sees when he looks at your temple. What does he see? Does he weep or does he rejoice? What does he do? For what purpose then, as we consider, what does he do? You, you, as you think about your life, is there an offering that is spiritually acceptable to God? One. Are you living like a priest, holy and set apart for him? Are you? The discussion between Jesus and the Samaritan woman in John 4, you know, Jesus speaks to her and Jesus reminds her and speaks so many things, having a conversation and she realizes, okay, maybe you're a prophet, maybe you're a man of God and so forth and they say, hey, but we worship somewhere. You know, there's worship that happens somewhere else. Not, not, not here. We are not in the right place. And I just began to think about my heart. I just began to think, are there moments <laughs> where you're seated alone and, and, you know, you tell God, not here, you know, let, let me first do this. We, we worship from somewhere else. <laughs> now, now it's not that, you know, just, I'll, I'll get back to you. No, not now. No, not, not now. Let, 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 you know, let, let me first do this kind of thing. And Jesus responds, the hour is coming and is now here. When true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For God seeks this. <laughs> let, 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 me, let, me, let me say a, a statement that might not be theologically right. I don't know. But worship is where you are and what you're doing. So the question then is, who do you worship? Who is your allegiance to? Who is Lord? Who is he? Do, do we relate with him like stepping in and out? Is, is it a job? Is it an eight to five? Is it a Saturday and Sunday thing? Is it a quiet time thing? What, where, where, where are you? Where is your temple? And when does worship begin? Does it end? Are you ending it? Is there a sin that has timetabled worship? So in, in this time, no. I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. The time has come. And the time is here. Guys, it's time to worship God in spirit and in truth. Two, four, seven. You have been in the faith too long to get in and get out. You, you who I'm seeing, you people here. TFC, we, we can allow and say, you know, things are difficult. You know, when I go to school, things become difficult. But in holiday, I'm, I'm for Jesus. But man, you know, we can allow them. You, 
need to make some decisions. A S A P. Are you listening to me? A S A P. You and I. Else, Jesus weeps. <laughs> I told you that before. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he. Blessed is he. All laid out. Cloaks are laid out. We are surrendering. You know that just spoke to me about devotion. Devotion is epic. Epic. Church is organized, arranged. Epic. The things are happening the way that they are supposed to happen. Steps up on a distance. And the word weep there is intense sobbing. That's a Greek meaning. So he just didn't do, <sighs> man, it's tight. No, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. He wept that weeping of someone is dead. He wept. So I thought about my life and I said, Lord, <laughs> <laughs> for how long? For how long? Just began to think about some things. I'm just thinking, surely, surely, there needs to be total commitment, evidenced in your speech and action and thoughts. Do not be conformed to the standards of this world, but be ye renewed your minds. And so, as we think about Peter, as I get ready to close for us to pray, as we think about Peter, Peter, Peter reminds us, of course, in verse 5, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But Peter goes on in verse 9. But you, but you, you have the privilege of being chosen of God. You are a chosen race. A royal priesthood. You've been chosen. You've been given the mandate. You've received the spirit of God. You have the indwelling spirit who brings conviction and brings truth. You a holy nation, a people for his own possession. He prides in being, you being his, his own possession. And he says that you may proclaim the excellencies, the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This you are chosen to proclaim from a standpoint of your choosing, your belonging, who you are, your person, your character, your fruit. That is the reason. And Jesus comes and Jesus finds tread and Jesus finds theft and Jesus finds thieves. Let me speak perhaps to you, brother and sister. You who is manipulative, you who is a thief, you who is a cheat, you who takes people's money and doesn't pay back, repent. 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 Maybe consider the place you are in. Repent. But trade signifies something else as well. Trade signifies how temporal these things are. The dwelling on that which is temporal. And John reminds us in 1 John 2.17, the world is passing away. Everything and its desires. And perhaps the question could be, are there things we are holding so dearly, so, de so close, 
So close. What is that? What is that that you consider? Let me, let me put the question this way. That you can fill in the gap. If I lose this, my life will change. What's, what's in that gap? What's in that gap? If I lose this, my life will change. That signifies something. That is speaking about something. That's a thread that Christ is speaking about. The temporal, that that passes away. Maranatha will find judgment on that. Maranatha will find judgment and punishment on that. Guys, I know we don't hear this so much from this place. But I need you to know as I speak to myself, that the end is coming. And that that will pull you from seeing him as he comes is the things of this world. So think about where you are and where the things of this world place in your life. Are there things that you're holding dearly? <laughs> those things might just be the sin that so easily entangles. What do you desire? The bigger question is why do you desire it? Is it to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness? Is that the reason? If it's not the reason, then we need to repent. So he seeks, his eyes move around seeking, seeking. He comes and seeks because you are the temple. But let me just say he doesn't just seek you here on Sunday or today. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. He seeks in your room. He seeks on your phone. <laughs> He seeks you. He seeks worship. He seeks on that laptop. He seeks. He seeks in that family. He seeks you. He seeks you when that remote is refusing and you want that thing, but the remote refuses. But it's, you say, no, I need to watch this thing today. He seeks worship. He seeks his eyes sick, looking for that faith. And Luke reminds us, shall he find true faith on the earth? Shall he find a heart that is devoted? A heart that has received the Prince of Peace? A heart that truly understands Christ? And so in Chronicles, just turn to that verse, 2 Chronicles, verse 16. Chapter 16, 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. The Bible says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. Whose heart? The heart of the matter. Is a matter of the heart. The temple that should be the house of prayer is your heart. That is where you need to look deep within. Your heart. And Proverbs reminds you to guard your heart with all diligence. For from it, we know, we know what springs out. Flow the issues of life. So what issues are going on? Are they submitted to the king? Are they submitted to the true prince or priest? Is he in control? Is he in control? Is your worship relational to him being the Lord? When things are going, when tough things are going on, where does he find you? Or perhaps, could it be like that woman 
We say, hey, we worship somewhere else. We, we, we worship. We worship where there are people. That's where we worship. We worship. And Jesus says, hey, 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 hey. Worship is where you are. Worship is what happens when you leave this place. Worship is how you treat your neighbor. Worship is what's going on every day. And so Jesus begins a work of cleansing. It was a kind of good thing, I thought. I thought, okay, this is actually a good thing. Jesus is angered. He says, this house has a purpose. It has a purpose. It has a purpose. You come to faith for a purpose. You live your life for a purpose. There's purpose. There's no purpose. You might not have a job. You might not have the job that you want. But you have purpose in the hands of God. You're an instrument in the Redeemer's hands. You're an instrument. You carry reconciliation. You have been reconciled to be an instrument to plant a seed. You have a purpose. And so he begins to cleanse and do a work. Let's end with Jeremiah 7. Jesus, uh, Jeremiah speaks. Of course, he's adopted. Den of thieves, den of robbers. He's adopted from Jeremiah. So Jeremiah 7, verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all of you men of Judah who enter these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds. Amend, change, transform, repent, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. How many times? The words are everywhere. This is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. Significance there is, hey, worship is going on everywhere, isn't it? Everywhere Christianity is being proclaimed. So don't trust in these deceptive words. As I think about myself, as I think about the teachers, the pastors, those who stand here, who proclaim, who call people to worship. And yet they are living in adultery. They stand in front of God. Stand and call people. And yet you have another woman who is not yours. Stand in front of people. And yet you steal. You use the purpose for your own gain. This place you stand and call on people to give money. For a work of God. You do that. Do not be deceived by these words. This is the temple. This is the house. Do not be deceived. And verse 5, he goes on to say, If you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice with one another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods in your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I give, I gave of all to your fathers forever. This dwelling of course, he's calling upon and saying, hey, if you dwell in this place was significant because he was there. He was in that place. And so the assurance of him being with us, the assurance of God being in the place where you are, the assurance that God is here is for us to amend our ways. Otherwise, we struggle. We spend hours to call upon him to lift our eyes, to sing Hosanna. And his response will simply be weeping. Weeping. Because I can't come there. Because purpose has changed. Because you're using this for a wrong reason. 
And so you might say this is the temple. And so you might have different things and activities. You might call conferences. You might call meetings. You might call all things and say this is the temple. But if you're not truly living as he desires, if there is no amending, if revival does not change our ways, we might sing of his miracles, but he will come to punish. As they did sing, as they sang about him, Hosanna, your miracles that you did, and yet he will weep. He will weep. Verse 8, behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say we are delivered? They will speak of a deliverance. They will say, you have been delivered. You have been set free. Yet their ways are wrong. And then he says, has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. I see. I see all things that are going on. I see what happens in the temple, but I see what happens in the temple. And you might proclaim deliverance. You might proclaim the Lord coming through. You might proclaim you getting your breakthrough. But if there has not been an amending of ways, he will not revive it. And so as Habakkuk sings as Habakkuk speaks of that poem. Revive it, O Lord. Revive your days to come. Revive your work in our lives. Revive your deeds. Revive your hand upon us. We cannot separate true walk, righteous walk. God has never had a problem with our devotions. Never. God's problem is with our walk with our hearts. That's what he wants to deal with. That's what revival should do. That's what this season should do for you. And not just this season. Believer, that's the life you should live for all the days of your life. That's where God wants you to be. Then he will revive. Then as Zachariah says, the refiner's fire will come. It will refine you like silver and gold. Then you will be able to proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Why don't you stand? So as we consider the time of prayer, I don't know what has stood out for you today. I just don't think it's a very new message to you. Uh, but it's a call on you today. And so as you meditate, I would like to call and give you an opportunity to think about this message and pray what you consider, what it is exactly that God is speaking to you. So let me, let me call on you to pray. Um, in your own words. Are there things that God speaks to you? You know, today, consider making some commitments to walk a certain way. I said so many things. But perhaps we begin with Hosanna. Hosanna. Save us. Save us. And perhaps, friends, you have not truly come to faith, Jesus Christ. You consider your life and you, and you wonder whether you are a Christian. Today, ask the Lord to forgive you. 
come in repentance and say, Lord, there's a life that I have been living. And I recognize that this life has not pleased you. So say, Lord, help me to receive you as you come. Ask him to forgive you. Maybe you do not know him. You have dwelt in the multitude of so many that sing Hosanna. Many, so many. But if you consider, possibly, Christ weeps. Christ weeps. He weeps over that song, that praise. Because you know, you know, that you're not living a life that pleases him. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to forgive you. Thank you, Lord. And in the same vein, possibly today, you are Christian, but you're struggling and you feel underweight, overwhelmed. Receive his peace. Encourage your soul. Hope in the Lord. Find trust in him again. Hope in him. No situation. Paul says, no temptation has seized you. Accept that which is common to man. But God is faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. Whatever it is that you're going through, he assures you and says, I will not leave you. Come on. You are mine. You are my own possession. You are mine. And he says, nothing will snatch you. That that comes to you will refine you and make you better. And so hold on because he comes. He will avenge the evil. He'll avenge the unjust. He will come as surely as he has said in his word. And so receive encouragement today. Receive encouragement. Come on, hold on. He that is, his, that is your shepherd says, hey, you need nothing. You lack nothing because he's your shepherd. Because he's a bishop of your soul. And friends, hear this and go with this. The Lord does not lose his own. The Lord never loses his own. Perhaps you're broke. Perhaps there's nothing to eat or drink. Perhaps you're in conflict and in pain. Perhaps you have a disease and you're calling for healing. Absolutely. May the Lord heal you. But if it doesn't feel like he's not coming through, oh, may you receive his assurance of his name, of his presence. The Bible says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Receive that peace. And perhaps for this category, many of us, including myself, fall. There are things that you're holding on to. You know that you need a cleansing work. You know. You know that. You know that. Open up your heart and say, Lord, I need your grace. Let it be as gold, as precious silver, purify my heart. Let me be as gold, a pure. Just sing that song and, and really honestly reflect on your heart. My heart's one desire is to be a holy, a set apart for you. Is that the prayer? Honestly, is it the prayer? Holy, 
Let's take it to purify my heart. Purify my heart. Let me be as gold and fresh as silver. Purify my heart. Find us fire, my heart's one desire. So as, you know, as the music just goes on, why don't you just pray and commit yourself to God. Friends, the Lord seeks, he seeks genuine vessels to use in a time where there's hopelessness, where there's pain, where there's frustration. He seeks you. He seeks you. Because the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. We are few because we love the world, because we love the things of this world, because we are living lives that are double. And the Lord calls you today as we consider, you know, Sunday and people being called to serve the Lord. I must begin by saying you must desire to live a life that pleases Him, to surrender committed fully to Him. That's what he desires. That's what he desires. Youth ministry. Revival will happen when you choose to commit to live completely to him and for him. Oh God, give us grace. Give us grace. Give us grace now. Give us grace now. Give us grace and strength. Oh Lord. Not to be taken in the norm. In the norm, you come into the temple and there's worship going on, a supposed worship, just a few meters away and you come into the temple and you find trade going on and everything looks normal. But you come and and there's anger and the disciple says zeal for his house consumes him. Friends, may we be consumed with what Christ is consumed with. Oh, Lord. If there's a choice today to be used of Him, such deep within now and Tell him what you need to let go of and ask him for wisdom to let go of it today. Today, 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 today. Tell him, Lord, I know I need to let go of this. Give me grace and wisdom today, 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 today. Then your house will be called a house of prayer. Spurgeon 
you know, alludes to the fact and he says, young people, we must pray because our desires are strong and our wisdom is little. We must pray. We must choose to come out of them and be separate. We must choose to be watchful of our company. Absolutely. We must choose to fix our eyes on God. We must choose to fix on He, the author, the perfecter of our faith. We must choose to run to Him that sin and the desires of this world will grow dim. We must make a choice. if we are to have fellowship with him. Lord, here we are. Here we are. Here we are as we consider this month. Now give us grace to not look back on the things of this world. That yes, we are in the world and yes, there's an effect of the world. But our desires will truly be for Christ. Truly from within. That whichever situation we find ourselves in, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our friendships and relationships, the first thing that comes to our minds will always be, Lord, what do you desire here? May that be our prayer. That indeed as the deer pants for the water, that our longings, our heart's desire will truly be for you. Oh, may we desire him. Dear brother and sister, now is the time. Desire him. Seek him. Seek him. Seek him. And seek him, not because this is the month. No, seek him, because now is the time for the true worshiper to worship in spirit and truth. Lord, will you give us grace and strength as we go through this month? Not to do it out of devotion. but to do it because we have the Prince of Peace, because we belong to you. Hear our prayer, Lord. Hear our heart's desire, Lord. And may this be a journey committed, intentional, to love you, to love your ways. That we think, as we think on, oh Lord, revive it. That that prayer will really be, revive it in my heart to truly, truly love you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. Revive it indeed. Give you many, many thanks. We give you praise. This we pray in Jesus' name.